So as we just reported, Rudy Giuliani has been ordered to pay two Georgia election workers nearly $150 million after a court found him liable for defaming them as he spread Donald Trump's big lie. And what really sunk Rudy here, apart from his, well, obvious guilt, was his refusal to publicly acknowledge what he did or apologize for his obvious and cruel wrongdoing, which of course is in keeping with the MAGA ethos. But public apologies for January 6th and the big lie are actually really important for the country's political health. Tens of millions of people still believe Trump won in 2020. He is currently running on that platform, basically, to finish the job he started on January 6th. And it's crucial that those responsible for the attempted coup are held accountable for their behavior and ideally state plainly and clearly publicly that the election was not stolen and what they did to try to overturn it was wrong. On the lowest rungs of the ladder, we often see this with the members of the insurrectionist mob who were later charged. There's been dozens, hundreds of them, like a, a man named Daniel Caldwell, one example. He's a former Marine who pleaded guilty to assaulting law enforcement officers with a dangerous weapon after he used chemical spray against police officers on January 6th. During a tearful apology in court, Caldwell said, quote, I must face my actions head on, according to the officers he assaulted. Quote, I hope that you and your country never have to face another day like January 6th. And even when it comes to coup plotters higher up in the scheme, like the defendants in Trump's Georgia racketeering case, we have seen some seemingly genuine contrition. If I knew then what I know now, I would have declined to represent Donald Trump in these post-election challenges. I look back on this whole experience with deep remorse. It was Trump lawyer Jenna Ellis during her guilty plea earlier this year. There's also a bail bondsman named Scott Hall, who was part of the election interference scheme. They helped break into a voting machine. He wrote a letter to the judge where he apologized for his role in the plot, and he took responsibility for his actions. But the other two Trump Confederates who pleaded guilty were not so contrite. The Atlanta Journal-Constitution received each of their letters to the judge in that case, part of the condition of their plea, and I will read them both in full. From coup lawyer Sidney Powell, quote, I apologize for my actions in connection with the events in Coffee County. That's it. Here's what we got from her fellow coup plotter, Kenneth Chesbro, quote, I apologize to the citizens of the state of Georgia and Fulton County for my involvement in count 15 of the indictment. Doesn't even say what he did. It's never been more obvious that to those few people do not regret their actions in the slightest, except perhaps insofar as they got caught. And one of the lessons here is that you simply cannot let people like Trump and his allies determine their own accountability because they simply will never do it on their own. They have to be brought to account by the full force of the law. Shan Wu is a former federal prosecutor, served as counsel to Attorney General Janet Reno. Josh Marshall wrote about these, quote, really sorry letters for Talking Points Memo where he is the founder and editor-in-chief, and they both join me now. Josh, I, um, <laughs> I don't, I've never, uh, oh, we lost you maybe, so I'll go to you, Shan. Um, Shan, uh, first of all, in your experience doing this kind of thing, is it common for someone on a plea to, to, to give such a obviously truculent F you to the entire proceedings and their apology? No, this is like the uh, I'm sorry you're ugly kind of apology. It, it's ridiculous. It's very transparent. And usually the defendant wants to take that moment to convince the judge who's going to sentence them that they are genuinely remorseful and they have learned something from this. And in this case, uh, it really seems that the defendants don't have that concern at all. Now, obviously, their plea structure gives them some solidity as to what they could, what's the worst case scenario. But honestly, I mean, if I were that judge, I wouldn't even accept that as having been the apology. And the prosecutor should take the same tactic, should be like a you know, school teacher saying, go back and try it again. You know, that, that was going to be my next question, because I really like, I think this is wholly unacceptable at a bunch of different levels. First of all, these are wealthy, privileged, affluent people who are getting to do a thing that, that hundreds of thousands of Americans who are run through the plea system, you know, every month in this country, don't get to do. But also, because stating that you were wrong about the specifics of what happened is important for the country's civic health and a huge part of why this is a meaningful prosecution. So, so you're saying the judge can be like, not good enough, try again. 
I, I think so. I, I don't know the judge could uh, say plea deals off because of this, but if part of the plea deal is the apology, I think the judge can say, hey, you know, you're not fulfilling that aspect of the plea deal. And obviously the reason here for an apology, you know, lots of cases, you know, people get convicted without an apology. But just like what you're saying, the critical point here is the harm done to the public and to our system and their acknowledgement is really critical. And too often, you know, there's this built in kind of bias in favor of white collar defendants because it's not a violent crime. Yep. They get treated more lightly. But these folks use, just like you're saying, their prestige, their power to abuse the system and hurt the country. And they really do need to be held accountable for that. Josh, I, I am not a, I'm generally a sort of wrathful person. Uh, it's not like, it's usually not how I go through life, but I like, I really felt like I hit the roof when I saw those yesterday. And, and I think you felt the same way because they are such an insult. After all of this, to do that, um, it's like a you can't touch me kind of thing. Yeah, there were there were so many layers of it because you know uh, Mr. Hall's letter, he's the bail bondsman you mentioned, was released in the same you know group of documents, and his is five paragraphs long. It you know pretty basic. I thought I was doing the right thing when it happened, but I see now I'm wrong. Right. I'm sorry, blah, and and you know okay, you know we we sort of assume someone is being uh, sincere, but but the, in the case of these two, a one sentence, not even really mentioning what they did. And then it's this additional level, which is hard to say substantive, but somehow brings it all together, which is that it's it's like, you know, it, uh, a workshop, pro, uh, you know, project in second grade, you know, yes. Dick and Jane's first plea negotiation. Like, what is this? Like, even like <laughs> yes. Bros. It's it's like, you know, it's it's like a it's like a five year old. And yeah. and these are this is a guy who went to Harvard Law School and and, uh, you know, both of them are career long successful attorneys. It's just weird. And when I saw it, I didn't quite know what to make of it. I mean, it, it in every way, it seems to communicate F you to yes. everybody, to the state of Georgia, to, to the people well, of Georgia, to the prosecutor. It's it's kind of wild. And, and, and there's one other aspect of this, because I think about, like, well, you know, what's what is punishment for? Right. I keep coming back to this in these cases, sort of like, you know, criminal criminal philosophy of crime 101. Right. Like it's like, you know, we want um, we you know, we want some uh, sort of accountability. Right. We want some sort of acknowledgement of the harm in a social sense. One of the things we also want uh, is deterrence. And like I read those two things and I am not convinced, Josh. That these two aren't going to just like get back on the on the train for 2024 to go plot again. No, absolutely. That was certainly the impression I got, and and um, yeah, yeah, and and clearly, as, as you say, it's a funny thing because you know uh, we don't want to be thinking of oh they should be shaking in their boots you know because the power of the law is is coming down on them, but there are other there are other reasons we have criminal sanctions. Yes. One is for the society to communicate to itself yes. what is permissible and what is not. And and something like this kind of communicates in a very basic way. And it's a big deal because they're the big public people. Right. No one knows who Scott Hall is, the other, the other uh, uh, defendant I was just referring to. And for them to do this basically says, you know, I cut a deal. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be on probation, but whatever. I, I do it again, and yeah. like I'm gonna, I'm gonna do like you know a little curly cue, uh, you know, a little smiley face, uh, one sentence. It's just I, I'm very. I mean, my impression was, and this may be, I guess the uh, these the deals are not finalized until the case, you know, until other aspects of the case come forward. But we haven't heard anything that the judge was like saying, okay, forget this. You got, you know, well, this is unacceptable. But yeah. Well, to Shan, to Shan, when, yeah. To Shan's point, I, I, I think that's that 100% should be the next step here and from Fannie Willis' office because I think we can all agree this is not acceptable. <laughs> I mean, yeah, just it's not, just, accept, not acceptable it's at all. Making a, it's a making a mockery of the, of the yeah, law that's right. and any kind of accountability they're supposedly taking. Shan, Will, Josh Marshall, thank you, gentlemen, both. Appreciate it.